Good morning. I'm Lori Stevens, Church Administrator at First Baptist Church of Sparks, Nevada. Pastor Morley's sermon is one of his most hard-hitting messages as he takes on what one political party promotes and believes. His sermon is from 2 Chronicles chapter 34 about the eight-year-old boy king of Judah, Josiah, and the godlessness rampant in Judah at that time. Several people said they wouldn't be coming back to FBC after hearing this message, while most were amening and praising the Lord for his truthfulness and honesty in what is going on in our country. One thing for sure is it is never dull at our church. I trust you will listen to the entire sermon and then make up your minds as to whether what pastor has to say is relevant or not. So as always, share these videos with your family and friends and subscribe and share and like. Thank you. Take your Bibles, the Word of God, and turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 34. I've entitled this sermon, God Can Use You. We know God's Word is powerful when we apply it to our lives. And we know God can use anyone, including children and teenagers, to display the, display the strength and truth of His Word. Some people feel that they are too young or too old or they let their past get in the way of doing something for the Lord. I hope this sermon will be an encouragement to help us see that God can and you will use any of us for His glory and, and our good. We know God uses all kinds of people to accomplish His purposes. We all have different gifts, abilities, strengths, and weaknesses. And if we surrender our lives to the Lord, we will see Him do amazing things with flawed people like you and me. This morning, and to start off the new year, We'll be looking at some lesser known people in the Bible that God used in wonderful ways. And we'll find out what we can learn from these unlikely servants. With that, let's look at King Josiah. King Josiah ruled the kingdom of Judah for 31 years from approximately 640 to 609 BC. He ascended to the throne at the age of eight after the assassination of his father, King Ammon. At this time, the kingdom of Judah was experiencing tremendous political and religious turmoil. The preceding kings of Judah, especially Josiah's grandfather Manasseh, who was the worst king of the southern kingdom of Judah, and Ammon, jo Josiah's father, who also led the nation into idolatry and the worship of foreign gods. They introduced various practices contrary to the Jewish laws and traditions, including the worship of Baal, Asherah, and other Canaanite, Canaanite deities. The religious corruption per permeated the society, and the temple in Jerusalem had fallen into disrepair. So this is the world this eight-year-old Josiah inherited. You know, we, we used to never think about bringing children into the world and worry about what kind of effect it would have on them, but we do today. From this sermon, we will see how God can use someone despite where they came from, what bad things they had done, or how youthful they may be to accomplish great things. Josiah gives us a great example of what God can do through our lives when we apply His Word and why we should not look down on someone's youth or background or past sins when it comes to serving Him. The main point of this sermon is to understand the power, the joy, and the hope that comes from the Word of God and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Meaning to me, despite our challenging circumstances, we can face whatever comes into our lives. So with that, let's look at the boy king of 2 Chronicles chapter 34, verses 1 through 3. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father David. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the wooden images, the carved images, and the molded images. Every Jewish person, man, woman, boy, or girl, knew the second commandment by heart. Thou shalt not make unto thee any grave, carved, molded, or wooden images, and bow down, down to them, nor worship them. And they did it anyway. As we will see from these three verses, there is a moving forward and not backward. 
These three verses sets the stage for the life of Josiah and his pursuit of the Lord. The nation of Israel was a mess when the kingdom was divided after the death of Solomon around 931 B.C., the northern kingdom of Israel had 19 kings until they were, they were conquered by the Assyrians in 722 B.C. All of those 19 kings were evil, and all of them were Democrats. The southern kingdom of Judah, which is in our passage this morning, had 19 kings and lasted for another 136 years until 586 B.C. when the Babylonians ended their kingdom. In the southern kingdom, you had a mix of good and evil kings. The evil kings would lead people into idol worship, child sacrifices, and all kinds of pagan debauchery. As the time of Josiah came to pass, he would come in on the heels of the two worst kings in the southern kingdom history. Imagine your eight-year-old becoming king of the country, of that country, and stepping into that mess. The people's expectations were pretty low. Most were thinking and expecting he would be a chip off the old block because the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. I'm sure they were thinking about his age, his evil father and grandfather, so it didn't appear Josiah would bring much hope and change. We know there was a large segment of that society which enjoyed all the state-sponsored sin, just like we have in America today, and that would be okay with them. They didn't care about the country. They didn't care it was going to hell in a handbasket, much like our country today, half our country today. Did you know 30 to 40% of our country are okay with open borders, abortion, gay marriage, transgenderism, sanctuary cities, uh, defunding the police, fighting other countries' wars, and the list goes on and on. We even elect in America today socialists, communists, atheists to high political office. That's the way it was when good King Josiah took office. If God were looking for someone to get, get the nation back on track, an eight-year-old kid would, with a horrible family legacy would hardly be the right kind of person for the job. But despite Josiah's age and background, in the eighth year of his reign, age 16, Josiah began to seek the Lord of his ancestor, King David. Josiah was a direct descendant of David. We do not know what sparked Josiah's interest in following in the footsteps of David, but verse 2 tells us he did not deviate from that path. Verse 2, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Here's an important truth. Moving forward and not backward implies that we do not allow the past to stop us from being used by God. It also means not allowing a bad past or a godless family to get in the way of moving forward in our Christian faith. At age 16, something within Josiah changed. Then at age 20, God led him to begin cleaning up Jerusalem for the past 55 years of idolatry and pagan worship. I think many times we are often held back because we allow our past to haunt our future. Our past can force us to conform to our family and friends' lifestyles and past actions. But that does not have to be. With Christ, we can break that cycle. This is hard to believe. But abusers usually come from abusive families. Many women who marry an alcoholic will get out of that situation and marry another addict. Or what we did in the past and who we were in the past can be a catalyst for change and growth. And I don't suppose anyone was expecting much from jo Josiah. That's why we can say Josiah proved to be a true dark horse. As Josiah moved forward in his reign at age 20, he commanded that the temple be repaired, and you can start to see the Lord blessing him. This passage in 2 Chronicles 34 describes Josiah's efforts to restore the temple of Jerusalem. Look there at 2 Chronicles chapter 34, verses 14 through 21. I'll let you read it in your Bible, and I'll just sum summarize it. So after six years into the renovations, the high priest Hilkiah discovered the book of the law in the temple referring to the five books of Moses, the Torah, the Pentateuch. This discovery had a profound impact on Josiah at the young age of 26. Hilkiah gave the scroll to the scribe Shaphan. 
and the scribe read the scroll to Josiah. Upon hearing the words of the law, Josiah tore his clothes as a sign of repentance. The scroll was further proof to Josiah that the nation was a mess. Here's what it would be like. Let's say we lost our First Amendment rights and the Bible was outlawed. And 50, uh, 55 years had passed and then the Bible was found. You can see how we would be grieved and convicted at how far away from the Word of God and our Christian faith we had gotten. Josiah asked a group of people in verse 20 to inquire of the Lord. He wanted to know what was going to happen to the nation as a result of their disobedience. In verse 22, this group sought the counsel of Huldah, the prophetess. Now, I'm going to let you read these verses and I'll summarize it. Do you see what Huldah was saying? The nation would pay for their disobedience, but not during the lifetime of Josiah. Because of his humility and desire and drive to get things back on track, God would reward Josiah because he did not allow his past or his youth to stop him from seeking the Lord and doing what was right in the eyes of the Lord. That can be you this morning. Our young people at First Baptist Church and in America have choices to make. And they are going to follow the crowd, peer pressure, do what everyone else is doing, or they'll make choices in line with following Christ, with their Christian faith. When I see tens of thousands of high school and college kids protesting for the destruction of Israel and in support of Hamas, I know they've chosen the dark side. When they are chanting from the river of the sea, they are calling for genocide. They are calling for the extinction of the Jewish race. As a teenager or young adult, one of your first choices you'll be making after you accept Christ is your choice of friends and whom you're going to marry. Are you going to listen to what God says or not? Here's what the Lord would tell you. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what part has a believer with an unbeliever? This is telling you as a Christian, a teenager, a young adult, do not pal around, become close friends with, or marry someone who rejects Christ and the Christian faith. It's talking about not becoming fast friends with those who would reject Christ. Or those from another religion like Buddhism, Islam, and Hinduism. That's not talking about other Christian denominations. Now that's just one of the many warnings. Let me give you another one. Proverbs 22, 24. Make no friendship with an angry man. And with a furious man, do not go. If you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend that has a violent temper... Get away from them. Do not date them, let alone marry them. And then let me throw in a third at no extra cost. And this is a big one, Proverbs 23, 20. Do not mix with wine bibbers, bibbers, that is heavy drinkers of booze, or with gluttonous eaters of meat. For the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty, and drowsiness will clothe a man with rags. If your friends are drinkers, pot smokers, party hardy types. Do not fellowship with them. Here it says do not mix with them. That is run around with them and for sure don't marry them. Just those three things from the Word of God would save our young people a lot of heartache and grief if they would only heed it. Now I would be derelict as a pastor if I didn't want mention one more and that is sex before marriage. That kind of intimacy is only for married people. If you want to get on the fast track to ruining your life, just become sexually immoral. A boatload of diseases, heartache and heartbreak follow those that disobey the Lord in this area, including addictions to pornography and sexual perversions. Much jealousy, hate, anger, and physical, emotional, and mental abuse has its roots in sexual immorality. St. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9, If you cannot contain yourself, then get married. Now, let me throw all of us a lifeline this morning. If we have been guilty of one, more, or all of the above, things I just mentioned, there is good news. You don't have to live under the guilt and shame of those sins. There is forgiveness and restoration in Christ. You can be forgiven this morning and get a fresh start, a clean slate, a new beginning. Here's what I would suggest. You did it, admit it. 
admit it to the Lord, and put it behind you and go on. Once you ask for forgiveness, you are justified just as if you had never sinned. The blood of Christ cleanses you. Take advantage of that. Now, Josiah would live to be 39 years old when in 609 B.C. he was mortally wounded on the battlefield at Megiddo. But God kept his promise to Josiah. Despite Josiah's efforts, the decline of Judah continued after his death, leading ultimately to the Babylonian conquest and exile in 586 B.C. One of my main points is this. When we move forward for the Lord, we will do so with God's blessings. And when we reject God's moral standards, we will start to decline like Israel. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 34, verses 31, 32, and 33. Then the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of the covenant that were written in the book. And he made all who were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin take a stand. So the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of God, the God of their fathers. Thus Josiah removed all the abominations from all the country that belonged to the children of Israel and made all who were present in Israel diligent to serve the Lord their God. All the days they did not depart from the Lord God of their fathers. Josiah was so moved by the scroll in 621 B.C. he renewed the covenant before the Lord, agreeing to follow the Lord and obey His commandments, His laws, and His rules with all his heart. Now notice, this was a heart change, a change of heart. Every Sunday after I preach, I give an invitation so you can respond either accepting Christ or for you to rededicate your life to Him anew one more time. And let me say this, you don't have to come forward. You can do it right where you're sitting. Josiah gathered all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem, read the book of the law to them, made a covenant with God to follow His commandments. Josiah then removed, destroyed all the idols and objects associated with foreign worship from the temple and throughout the land. Josiah was not looking to be religious. His heart was a heart for the Lord. If you're here this morning, here's what it would be like if you were Josiah. You would go home after church and get rid of all the pot, the hard liquor, the pornography, along with your lying, stealing, and profanity-filled language, and make the Bible as a centerpiece of your home and your life. Amen. Here's Josiah's conviction led him to get all of Jerusalem and the tribe of Benjamin to do the same. Verse 32 says, The residents of Jerusalem acted in accordance with the covenant of God. We Christians would say a revival took place. This young man who took the throne at the tender age of eight, after his father was assassinated after a short two-year reign, changed the nation. Look at verse 33 again. Josiah removed all the detestable idols from all the areas belonging to Israel and encouraged all who were in Israel to worship the Lord their God. I would say this underdog, this dark horse, far exceeded any expectations of him. What Josiah did took a great deal of courage. I'm sure many in his kingdom loved the debauchery that came along with pagan worship practices. But the end of that kind of life is misery, suffering, and hell. Like a large part or percentage of those in America today, they also show they love those things by voting the godless into office. And what we need to do is what Josiah did and what Christians have done for the past 2,000 years, and that is take a stand for Christ, for the Christian faith, and against evil. Let me say, first of all, the Democrats we have at First Baptist Church are not the Democrats of today. They are for, from the party of Harry S. Truman and John F. Kennedy. They were for the little guy. And it's been, this party has been hijacked by the woke liberal progressives of today. I got into a debate in the foyer here a few weeks ago with one of our members. He said, Pastor, you're not saying you can't be a Democrat and be a Christian, are you? And I said to him, you can't be a warm-hearted, obedient Christian and support killing unborn babies, open borders, transgenderism, and on and on and on. To me, for you to be an active supporting Democrat with their beliefs 
and, and say you're a Christian, you would have to be very ignorant or terribly backslidden. But I'm still encouraged for our country. I remember what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 18. He said unto you, Peter, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the, the church. And another verse that I like to meditate upon is 1 John 4, 14. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And then it goes on to say, they are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. That's what's happening to America today. People are following and listening to godless teachers that don't care about morality, God, you, America, or the Christian faith. Now listen, the Constitution was never meant to go against the God of the Bible. But today the godless use it as a battering ram to destroy America, our children, and the Christian faith. I mean, they use it to kill innocent unborn babies for nine months, practice sodomy, and even use it to worship Satan in our courthouses. It's insane. It's nuts. And we have these so-called Christians supporting these things. It boggles my mind when they call abortion women's health care or reproductive rights. It is so vile. The devil uses words that are similar to confuse us. I have to admit it probably took me 10 years to get straight in my mind and see the difference between pro-life and pro-choice. Let me end with this. Josiah's remarkable life teaches us that you can come from generations of godless families, from cycles of addiction and abuse, atheism and anti-Christian views, and you can become something special with him. You can't break the cycle as Josiah did. You don't have to be like the family you grew up in. You don't have to follow the crowd. You can be different. You can't follow the Lord. You can't break the cycle of abuse, violence, addiction, and godliness. And you can be that one. The historical context of 2 Chronicles 34 reflects a critical turning point in the religious and political landscape of Judah. Just so, we are at a critical turning point in America this morning. And the only thing that will bring us back from the brink is the Bible, Jesus, Christianity, and our faith. Josiah's reforms were a sincere attempt to restore the nation's faithfulness to God and to reverse the consequences of idolatry and wickedness that had plagued the nation for years. That's what we're praying for this morning, that God would restore morality and faith in America. And one person can make a difference, and that person can be you regardless of your background, your age, young or old, your sins, what you might have committed or not have committed, whether you grew up in a godless family or not. You can be that person to make a difference. Now, we know you can't or won't save the world, but you can make a difference in your sphere, in your circle of friends, in your family at First Baptist Church of Sparks. And as always, it starts with accepting Christ, and I want to give you that opportunity. If you're listening to me, if you're watching me, and you'd like to become a Christian, or you'd like to rededicate your life to Christ, pray this prayer with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I know I'm a sinner. I ask Jesus to forgive me for all my sins and take me to heaven when I die. In Jesus' name, amen. May the Lord bless you. I hope to see you next Sunday with another sermon.